All right. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, glad you could all join today. Uh, just again to remind you, if you haven't already, please sign in with your name uh, as you join. Um, so today I'm really excited to introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Vladimir Bulovic, uh, who's a professor of electrical engineering at MIT. Um, he, um, he's done many, many things. <laughs> he directs the Organic and Nanostructured Electronics Laboratory, co-leads the uh, uh, Solar Frontier Center, leads the uh, Grid Edge program, and is also founding director of MIT Nano. Uh, which is uh, an amazing nanofabrication facility and prototyping facility at an MIT campus. Um, he's also uh, quite an innovator, a fellow of the National Academy, at the National Academy of Inventors, and uh, inventor of over 120 patents, and also has helped start up um, a number of different companies, including uh, Ubiquitous Energy Inc., which has developed nanostructured solar technologies, uh, Kativa Inc., which is focused on a printed electronics and QD vision, um, which has produced quantum dot optoelectronic components. So uh, a number of very successful companies employing a lot of people and creating products that are used by millions. Um, uh, Vladimir was the first associate dean for the innovation for innovation of the School of Engineering and the inaugural co-director of MIT's innovation initiative, which he co-led from 2013 to 2018. And also definitely of note, um, he's been recognized uh, by winning the McViker, if I pronounce it correctly, fellowship, uh, which is MIT's highest teaching honor, which is a huge honor where, uh, at MIT, which has a number of outstanding uh, teachers. So that's a, that's a really big deal. So, um, uh, you know, I'd like to you know, have you take it away. We're really uh, thrilled to have you here today um, talking about some of uh, the, the potential of nanotechnology. Um, you know, going into the future. So uh, why don't you take it away? Uh, the way we're going to do questions today, I'm sorry, I didn't mention this. Um, please um, type in your questions in the chat. We're going to take them as they go today. So um, uh, when uh, we reach a good uh, good pausing point, point I'll, uh, I'll call on you when you've asked a question. Um, so uh, Vladimir? Dan, thank you so much. It's uh, uh, truly an honor uh, to have a chance to uh, present at this BeaverWorks Summer Institute event. Uh, you're an extraordinary bunch of students. We very much hope we one day have a chance to cross paths with you, hopefully here at MIT. But wherever you go next, you'll find yourself changing the world. I'm sure of that. I've seen previous generations of Beaverwick Summer Institute students, and I have been thoroughly impressed. Um, I have uh, today uh, a, a set of visions of what might the world look like. And I started with a premise uh, that the future will be measured in nanometers. So what I would like to do is utilize this time together to give you some examples of what could be that the future will look like. I started sharing my slides. Hopefully you can see them. Yes. OK, good. <laughs> very good. Um, I guess to start us off, maybe the very first thing to do is to ensure that you find yourself wanting to ask me questions. Um, I will present to you a series of different ways of thinking about technology. So hopefully some of those will get you sufficiently excited to ask more and say, well, that's not enough. I want to know even more about it. We'll go uh, uh, with the flow. So please do feel comfortable interrupting. Um, I'll start off then showing you just the size of what one nanometer is. You have heard of a meter, it's just about one yard, a little bit longer. Um, and 10 meters is about the width of a typical home. So you go 100,000 times smaller and you get to the scale of a width of a human hair. That's about 100,000 nanometers in width or 100 microns in width. You go 100,000 times smaller than that and you get to the width of a carbon nanotube that is one nanometer in width. Today in the labs at MIT across the world, we can manage one nanometer relatively easily. We can actually make things routinely that are nanometer in size. We have been making things routinely that are nanometer in size for centuries. <laughs> we just didn't know that. We didn't know that it's those smallest of the features, those smallest of dimensions, 
that guide the way the world will truly operate. So let me show you some examples that you might have not necessarily recognized before. So I'll show you some chunks of gold and silver. Um, here is some gold and some silver. Now, it doesn't look like a typical chunk of gold and silver. What these are is a chunk of gold that was then split into two pieces. One of those pieces was then split again and again and again, eventually leading you to a nanoscale-sized chunk of gold and nanoscale-sized chunk of silver. If you make enough of those nanoscale-sized chunks, those little nanocrystals, let's call them, you can put them in a liquid. They'll float in a liquid. You can shine light on them, and they'll reflect certain colors of light. If you have little chunks of gold, they'll reflect colors like yellows and oranges and reds. Indeed, the vials that are yellow, orange, and red happen to have those small pieces of gold. The blues and the greens, those are silver nanoparticles. When you make silver small enough, it doesn't reflect all of the colors of light like it did before, making it mirror-like. It actually reflects only some colors of light, the ones that happen to have, well, an ability to be absorbed by this chunk of metal. This chunk of metal changes its ability to absorb because of its size. You know that light can be described either as a wave or a particle. A light wave or a photon is what we would have called it. The one thing you might not know is that the electrons are also both waves and particles. We don't really think of it that way because the wavelength of the electron is on the scale of nanometers very few nanometers. So if I give you a chunk of silver and I have an electron on it as I do, that electron has to make sure that its wavelength, its wave function so-called, goes around the nanoparticle and meets the tail of it exactly where it started. The size of the particle determines what is the energies and of electrons that can sit on it, and consequently, what colors of light can be absorbed by that particle or reflected by that particle. What is cool about nanoparticles of, let's call it silver or gold, is that it's a technology we've been known for centuries. Here's an example of how to use it. If you happen to be a nanotechnologist of the Middle Ages, you would use gold and silver nanoparticles to color the stained glass windows. Now, you didn't really know that that's exactly what you were doing. You were typically following grandma's recipe, you said, who said that you should go to that side of the mountain, pick up that chunk of stone, put it into a molten glass, steer it just right, add a little bit of cow's milk and maybe a little bit of horse's hair, do the appropriate dance, wait an hour, and the glass will turn blue or green or red, depending on what particular metal and what nano-sized particles you were cooking in those molten glass chunks. Spread it into a tin sheet and you got yourself a stained glass. That stained glass stays stained forever. Why? Because it's made of materials that don't decay. Glass and chunks of metal, nanoscale chunks of metal inside them. That's what we did in Middle Ages with nanoparticles of silver and gold. Today, we can go to the labs of Professor Lee Gerke, a biologist at MIT, and they would tell you that those very same nanoparticles of silver can be used in a very clever way to detect Ebola, West Nile, Dengue, Zika, COVID-19 proteins. Well, how does that work? You notice that some of those vials of silver were green and some of them were blue. The reason why the difference in the color is because some of the chunks of silver were a little bit smaller and some of them were a little bit bigger. Small are blue, little bit bigger ones are green. The nanoparticle changes its color if it changes its size by just about a nanometer or so. Can we use that to detect all these diseases? We can. 
what if every one of those nanoparticles had on the surface of it a molecule that is a perfect complement to the protein in COVID-19? If so, that molecule that's sitting on the outside of the nanoparticle will be kind of like a, you can think of it, well, like a sticky tape or Velcro, where a molecule of protein of COVID will come by, attach itself to this Velcro, and add itself to the nanoparticle of silver. The nanoparticle of silver just grew in its size, which means it will also change its color. Can I use this to detect these viruses? Yeah. Take out of your blood a drop. Just pinprick your finger. Take a drop of blood. Put it onto a piece of paper. Here are some of the paper strips that in Lee Gerke's lab they develop. You drop the drop of blood. The paper is a microcapillary medium, a medium that is able to let the water or liquid diffuse through it. You know that because if you spill some liquid like coffee or tea or any other colored liquid on a piece of paper, give it time and it's going to spread through that paper. Blood in the same way will. And it will spread through that piece of paper. If that piece of paper has on it little strips of different nanoparticles, if the blood happens to have the protein that will bind to that nanoparticle, the particle will grow bigger and its color will change. And as it does so, you have a detection method for knowing that particular disease was in your blood. If you're looking at West Nile virus, uh, it has first been detected in fairly remote places in Africa, a village far away from a distribution center or any big town. To typically test with the usual method, pe people in that village for presence of West Nile, someone would need to walk to the village carrying a refrigerator on their back. <laughs> Why? Because they need to draw the blood of the villagers, refrigerate the blood samples as they bring them back to the town that can analyze the samples. Once they analyze the samples, they can recognize the presence of the virus in the blood and then walk back to the village to inform the villagers who's infected, who isn't. That process might take a couple of days, walking over, drawing blood, walking back, analyzing, walking over to inform the villagers. This process, this piece of paper with nanoparticles, takes about 20 minutes. It can dramatically change the way the diseases are spread, as we can diagnose them much more rapidly by using nanoscale discovery that can be very easily, uh, very easily um, sc scaled for the many people's use. Indeed, rather than carrying a refrigerator, the scientists, medical doctors, do not only carry paper strips, a light package of these paper strips is all that's needed to make them have a chance to actually diagnose the presence of diseases. Nanoscale is indeed the definition of the scale at which drugs and vitamins happen to exist. Now, to give us a scale bar, I uh, like to draw benzene you heard of benzene, right? Six carbon, six hydrogens, they make a perfect hexagonal ring. If you are a very detailed chemist, you might draw it like this with hydrogen being attached to these vertices. Every vertex is meant to represent a carbon atom. If you want to do it quickly, you would just draw it as a hexagon with the understanding that any unsaturated bond will have a hydrogen saturating it so that you have four bonds for every one of those carbons. Benzene is about a third of a nanometer in size. So let me draw some pictures of some drugs and some vitamins. Aspirin, ibuprofen. Notice the size of these molecules. They are a few times bigger than benzene, maybe three times bigger. Well, that's just about a nanometer. When you get sick and you're trying to fix yourself, you're eating nanoscale objects to fix yourself. <laughs> Vitamins A, B, C, and D are not much bigger. They are one to two nanometers in size. So are the dangerous drugs, cocaine, LSD. Nanoscale affects us both positively and negatively. And it's important to understand 
how does that nanoscale truly, truly work? Now, you also know that inside your cells, there are nanoscale features that might define the way your cell works, very specifically DNA. DNA, just so you know, is two nanometers wide. And in the 1950s, it was proposed that there might be inside every one of our cells something else, some twisted molecule called DNA. Now, the first time people started asking this question of what's inside our cells actually started in the late 1800s, 1869, exploration for what eventually was discovered as DNA begins. People start saying, well, we can see under regular optical microscope cells and there seems to be some stuff inside them. If we could only see smaller features, maybe we'll understand what that stuff is. But our tools were not good enough to see those very small features. Our tools were requiring us to have a periodic structure, a structure that you can explore by using diffraction. If you have a perfect crystal and you can bounce x-rays off of it and there is periodicity in that feature you're examining, x-rays might bounce off. They have wavelengths on the scale of sub-nanometers. They'll bounce off and they'll constructively or destructively interfere as they bounce off. That's known as diffraction. That diffraction image obtained in 1950s by Rosalind Franklin is shown in the upper left there. Notice the pattern that of crossed spots. This is highly, highly unusual. A typical molecule will show you maybe square pattern of spots, but not a cross pattern of spots. That is what eventually led to the supposition that was presented by Watson and Crick that there might be a twisted molecule, some sort of a helix in there that happens to generate that diffraction pattern. Now, you can imagine the first time this was proposed, people would say, you're crazy. We've never seen a twisted molecule. This can't be, and it can't be something that defines us. But arguments went on, maybe for a decade, and eventually people started accepting it, eventually awarding the Nobel Prize to Watson and Crick for suggesting it. So it took nearly a century of exploration by hundreds of people to discover what became known as a DNA. What if we had tools of today to explore what is inside our cells? Well, if we did, we could go ahead and shrink the 84 years into a couple of days of work. This is a scanning tunneling microscope image of a DNA on top of a flat surface. You might notice there is a feature that's two nanometers wide, happens to have what we now draw as a set of ladder steps, happens to kind of get broader and then narrower, just like any twisted molecule that might have a flat surface that twists would be. Huh. And this was obtained in, well, <laughs> uh, early 21st century. With the tools that we have today in the second decade, third decade of the 21st century, we can do much more, much more detailed resolution images. This particular image would take a couple of hours to obtain. Even maybe the first time you got it and you didn't believe this is inside your cell, just redo it a few more times. In a weeks of experimentation, you probably would convince yourself you're looking at the twisted molecule that comes from inside your cell. 84 years by hundreds of people is reduced to just a couple of hours or maybe a week or one person's work because we finally have the tools to see the nanoscale. And those tools became available very, very recently. Here is one. Um, hey, Vlad, Vlad? Yeah. Sorry. Um, if, if I can interrupt ahead, for, for a little, yeah. um, there are a bunch of questions coming in. Um, that, uh, sorry to interrupt in the middle of the, the no, 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 please go. The go, DNA go. story, per but there are a bunch timing. of questions that are coming up actually back on the, um, the virus detection. So yes. if I can call on some of them, uh, Chloe Gao, would you like to ask your question? <laughs> You said that like um, once like a virus sticks to the nanoparticles, it changes in size and that's why the color changes. But if there are two um, viruses that are similar in size, is there a way to differentiate what type of virus? Yes, it's a great question. Um, so the 
nanoparticles are dressed with molecules that are specific to the specific uh, analyte or virus we are trying to detect. So the, you can think of it almost like a perfect Lego piece fitting onto another perfect Lego piece. Um, one way of describing these nanoparticles are almost like tennis balls. They have a hard inside, but the outside happens to be fuzzy. And that fuzziness is the molecules that are attached to the nanoparticle. When the attachment between that fuzziness and the protein of Zika, of uh, COVID or any of the other uh, um, uh, viruses we are trying to detect happens, then this attachment now makes the nanoparticle plus the fuzz on the outside, plus the protein, a single object that is a slightly bigger than the nanoparticle used to be. The electrons of the nanoparticle now find a way to get into the protein and roam back out, hence having a larger space to roam around, hence changing the wave function of the electron, hence changing the color of the nanoparticle. Hopefully that helps. Thank you. Of course. All right. Um, let's see. Why don't we, is all right to take a few more on this topic? Of course, uh, of course. A number of questions. Yeah. So um, let's see. Um, Aishwarya uh, Udeshi, would you like to ask your question? Yeah. So my question was, uh, do you think the speed and simplicity of this method of testing for viruses would be able to help even out medical inequities since uh, in some places in the world, um, it's harder to do the traditional type of testing? I, uh, Ashwarya, that is exactly, I think, what this would be transformational medicine for. It is cheaper, it is simpler, but much more importantly, it's accessible in more easier way to very remote places that otherwise would not have a chance to have the, a, a high-end diagnostic. It's, you know, I can't claim that th this particular diagnostic, as I understand, is really, really good. But there is always an even better way to do it, except it always becomes a question of how many people can you serve versus how much funding would you need to expend to serve those people. Uh, and here is there's a great balance. This is a simple, cheap diagnostic, requires a piece of paper and nanoparticles that can be synthesized in a single step, dressed with another layer of molecules that can also be synthesized in a single step. Great question. Let's see, uh, Jaden Lee, would you like to ask uh, your question? Yeah, so I guess it was kind of similar to that, like you kind of address this a bit. Um, so I was wondering how expensive is it to use this like method of using like nanoparticles um, for detecting viruses, like compared to I guess like current methods, maybe like using like PCR or like antigen tests? Because I know like the gold and silver like might cost like a bit of money to get that. Yeah, you're asking a great question, but uh, do keep in mind that we are using nanoscale amounts of gold and silver. Um, I mean, it turns out that everything pretty much costs the same per kilo if you make a lot of it. <laughs> um, and aspirin, right, is a nanoscale object that we make every day. Uh, and yet it doesn't cost anything pretty much given uh, the methodologies that we developed to make it. So same fashion for the nanoscale particles, it really is not, is not a big deal. Nanoscale uh, particles, for example, are used uh, of silver, are used as antifungal agents in socks. If you are, <laughs> if you're choosing socks that never smell, uh, they are typically have some sort of nanoscale coating and that could be a nanoscale coating of an extremely small particles of silver. Uh, silver has been used as the antifungal agent from the time of the ancient Greeks. They would take a silver coin and put it inside a grain bowl that to, so that as the grain bowl gets transported over ships, the grain doesn't spoil. And that's because the silver itself has the antifungal, <laughs> antibacterial uh, property. But, you know, again, um, it, cost is always important to ask. You're using nanoscale quantities and hence the cost would be extremely small. Okay, um, let's see. I don't know how much longer you want to spend on this topic, but maybe maybe I'll call on one more question. Of course. Um, so I apologize. Uh, there were lots of great questions. So I'm just going to choose actually the, the one that just came in. Uh, Ella Cronman, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, um, my question was, um, what makes gold and silver like uniquely able to like test out and detect the virus? I'm wondering, like, can we use other metals or like what specific properties do they have? 
you, you could use other metals, and that's a fantastic question. Um, the nice thing about gold and silver is that they do not oxidize very much. Uh, silver does, it tarnishes, but once it does, it kind of stops pretty much. Um, but gold doesn't. And so, uh, and also the other thing is because of all of the chemistry that people have done up till now on gold and silver, we know how to attach that fuzzy thing on the outside. We know really well how to attach it to a gold or, or silver surface. So you might as well do that. Uh, but, uh, you know, other metals uh, could do the job for you as well. Uh, it's just that this is the one that was perfected first. Thank you. Of course. So then should I maybe move on? Show a few yeah, more ideas? Um, I, I, I apologize to everyone who had no, no, the questions that we didn't get to. But um, I, you know, I just thought you might want to uh, move on to the yeah. Move on. I'll, I'll show you a few more. I mean, I, I expect you will hopefully be excited about a number of other things I show you as well. Um, I was telling you that really what has changed in the last couple of decades is our ability to see the nanoscale in precision that we never could imagine before. And you know, you might have heard the phrase "a picture's worth a thousand words." Well, I have indeed passed this kind of images by some of our colleagues that happen to have won Nobel Prizes in biology. And they said, you know, a picture is actually in biology is worth a million words. It can explain so much more given the complexity of biology, given the complexity of how our body works and how are all these different nanoscale objects interacting with each other. There is an instrument called cryotransmission electron microscope that has been invented a little while ago, but perfected and made available in a way that can reliably get measurements over and over again um, on biological objects uh, to the precision of a single atom. It can show you how protein is put together. And that image on the right side of my slide shows you an image of a protein that uh, every nodule on that image is an atom. And you can see the how it all bends together, folds, forms this particular shape. Well, why would I want to know that? Well, I would want to know it because any medicine I make needs to fit like a key inside a lock in order to make a particular part of my DNA act a certain way, a particular protein fixed, or whatever else I'm trying to fix around my body. This instrument is uh, available at MIT. The MIT Nano is a facility we built and indeed, anyone can come and use it. We need to train you on it. Uh, and you have to have a project uh, so that we know that you can direct all this potency of this amazing new tool set towards the next set of grand discoveries you're aiming for. The nanoscale defines the way we are put together and the way we operate. And if I can see the features of what happens down there, I might be able to learn more about how the physics truly works. And from there, extrapolate the next set of devices and technologies I might want to build. Here is some more images. Uh, this is not biology. This is uh, tungsten diselenides, a material that forms a 2D sheet. You might have heard of graphene that forms hexagonally co close packed thin film that's one atom thick. Tungsten diselenide kind of does the same thing. Now, what we're going to do is look at atoms in the tungsten diselenide sheet, and you can look at them. Those, those are the tungstens. You can see the scale bar, so you know that you're seeing very, very small features on the right side. What the other thing we're going to do is take that sheet of tungsten diselenide and sandwich it between two sheets of another flat material, boron nitride. Boron and nitrogen are both light. Tungsten is heavy. So as a result, in this particular microscopy, the way I'm seeing the images, I shine electrons onto the sample and they'll bounce off the biggest atoms that are available. Tungsten would be a good one there. And consequently, I get myself the hexagonal and closed pattern. Now, this is an image. Every one of those little circles is an individual atom. What would be even cooler is if I could see those atoms jiggle around. And it turns out you can. The instruments of today allow us to see that. Every one of those white circles that looks like a billiard ball is an atom. Some of them are coming in, some of them are coming out. You can start seeing a fissure opening up where the blue arrow is. 
you can see where the red arrow is, individual atoms floating around and then eventually adding to the sheet of tungsten diselenide. Why are they bouncing? Well, because those electrons that I'm using for imaging are hitting them and giving them a little bit of energy. So they wiggle. Sometimes the ones at the edge get shaved off. They sometimes come back and reattach themselves. Seeing how the nanoscale is put together is remarkable. <laughs> it opens up many more venues in thinking of what could be possible to do with such material sets. I'll zoom out a little bit and get from the nanoscale to tens nanometers, hundreds of nanometer scale, micron scale, and show you this image. This is a directly assembled, you can think of it as 3D printed object. It's an object that's designed to be very strong upon mechanical impact. So how do you do it? Well, you go ahead and make an object that has a lot of empty space. So if someone pushes against it, it that empty space can allow the spaces, the connected spaces to bend, twist, and take the force of the hit of the small, in this case, nanoparticles hitting it. Um, and when it bounces off, the object itself extends. You can make the strongest materials, ones that can sustain the most shock by designing the material down to the scale of nanometers. You can also analyze with these such tools, <laughs> analyze the actual mechanical property of matter. So here is another kind of set of measurements we can do. Take some of those nanoscale porous materials, compress them, image them at the same time. So you get a good scale understanding of how are they being compressed? What happens to the compression process? And then at the same time, measure the forces. And from there, learn about stress and strain material experiences. What are the steady state conditions? What's the physics of this material? And how do you improve upon it? These are the abilities we can now take on because of having the tools we have of today. And through it, designed an entirely new age, the nano age. The age that will allow us to redesign matter from scratch using nanoscale Lego blocks that can be put together and guided towards the next set of technical ideas and next set of solutions for humanity. I have mentioned uh, Vlad, can I, can I can I jump in with a question here? Um, of course. Uh, so, uh, Logan uh, Reich, uh, would, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yes. Hi. I was just uh, wondering how, like, assembling something like the materials you're showing on the slide of the slide before, like, precisely, how does that like work? Because it's on such a small scale, I can only imagine how difficult that could be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it turns out that we can make objects like this, like the one on the right, in a couple of hours of work. Um, and actually, you are not doing the work. The tool is doing the work. What you've done is did a CAD design and cleverness of how to how the matter will behave. And then you go ahead and 3D print it. Now, when I say 3D print it, in this case, what we do is we start with a liquid polymer that's in a beaker. You can think of it that way. And then you shine uh, two laser beams. The place where they cross, the light will be extremely bright. And those photons can be absorbed by the polymer and as a result cause the polymer to harden, to cross polymerize and form a not liquid, but a solid form of the polymer. So keep on going and crossing the laser beams from one and the other direction. And as a result, in a 3D space, you can build any object you want. You can think of it as a 3D printing. Eventually pull out your object, the liquid will run away, and you're left with a solid object like this. <laughs> but your resolution is down to the scale of whatever the laser beam can do. And that can be as small as 100 nanometers in size in uh, some of the best uh, direct right laser printings. Great question. All right, and uh, maybe one more while we're paused. Uh, Venkata, Venkata, would you like to ask your question? Uh, so I was wondering if the atomic scale is like the current limit. You mentioned a couple hundred nanometers. Um, do you see a potential for going smaller than that? And if so, what are some of the limitations that would need to be crossed? 
Well, you can make it as small as you wish. Uh, meaning, <laughs> back in the late 1990s, early 2000s, um, a group at IBM Almaden used the scanning tunneling microscope, that microscope that imaged the DNA. Um, the way it works, it goes and has a tip that comes, a very, very sharp tip that comes to a surface. If there is an atom protruding from that surface, the tip will tunnel the electrons from the tip into that atom and then into the surface. And by scanning the tip, you can recognize that there are little nanoscale bumps on the surface, meaning the atoms. If you apply the bias very fast and reverse the bias at the same time, <laughs> you'll be able to pick up an atom from that surface. And then you can go ahead and drive it wherever you want and then spit it onto a surface wherever you wish. This is how they made what are known as quantum corals, a designed feature of atoms exactly where you want it that contained a, a sea of electrons on a metal surface forming, well, <laughs> uh, well-confined wells or corals of electrons. Um, they came up with some clever ways of making optical, uh, sorry, electronic logic down on nanoscale and so forth. But there is nothing stopping you from doing it. It's more to ask, um, how many of these do you need to make? Because, uh, for example, if your goal is to make a, a chip to run your computer today, you're going to need a few billion of those, uh, uh, those features to be made. Uh, let's call them transistors. Well, that's going to take a long time if you do one at a time. So coming up with clever ways of designing features that can be made very uh, scalably or very large area is really, really good and really good to come up with. There is a technique, uh, you know, companies like uh, Intel, uh, uh, Taiwanese Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, TSMC, Samsung, they can make features to make your chips that are as small as seven nanometers, five nanometers. Uh, TSMC just announced that by the end of the year, they'll be able to make a chip that uses, or early 2023, that uses three nanometer critical dimension transistors. That's remarkable. Now they can't make a three nanometer feature in another one right next to it. You need to space the next one. But if the critical part of your device is the length of that particular channel in your transistor, oh my gosh, we have gotten to the scale of you know 10 atoms, 20 atoms is the length of the transistor channel. That can now be done for billions and billions of transistors. Um, so technology is amazing, but it's the tools <laughs> of being able to actually make it at that scale. That's lithography, etching, the position, and the tools of imaging what you've done. So they actually have confidence for moving forward. Great questions. Thank you. Let me show you a few more nanoscale things that you happen to experience every day. Sense. Um, meaning uh, the way we smell things, happen to be nanoscale in size. And my computer, oops, there we go. <laughs> um, so here is an example of a benzene, again, to give us a scale bar. And here are examples of some of the molecules that happen to make smells. Uh, lemon, raspberry, orange, vanilla. Notice each of them is just a couple of maybe three, maybe four benzenes in size. So one nanometer in size. So wait a second. If I'm smelling a really good smelling vanilla cookie, are you telling me that my nose is detecting those nanoscale molecules? Well, yeah, <laughs> you're designed to smell those nanoscale molecules. Well, wait, wait. Why do they need to be nanoscale? Why can't I smell maybe a bigger thing? Well, the scents don't need to be nanoscale. They just happen to be nanoscale. <laughs> and the reason for them happening to be nanoscale is, well, if you have a very small molecule and it's sitting on top of your cookie, that molecule has a very weak van der Waals bond to the cookie because it has a very small surface. The bigger its surface, the more electrons it would have that would choose to stick to the cookie. The smaller it is, 
the less of a surface it has, the fewer electrons that are available to electrostatically attract themselves to the cookie. And so what they do? They float in the air. They bounce around between oxygen and nitrogens, and eventually, through diffusion, they reach your nose. Your nose is designed to experience nanoscale. Notice, for example, the image of lemon and orange. I did some, something tricky there. Notice that those two molecules are actually the same molecule. It's just that one is a mirror image of the other. Well, why did I do that? I did that because all of my molecules drawn on this screen are perfectly flat. When in fact, that's not the case. Every molecule is curved. It could be concave or it could be convex. Difference between a lemon and an orange is in one case, the molecule is concave, and in the other case, it is convex. <laughs> the bent of the nanoscale molecule makes the smell, the scent, different as experienced by our nose. You are designed to experience sub-nanometer features of the molecules. And you have millions of detectors that do that every day. Now, you are not the only one who can smell. As a matter of fact, if you can smell ethylene, and this company, C2 Sense, realize how to do it, if you can smell ethylene, ethylene is emitted, it's a plant hormone. It's emitted anytime fruits ripen. So if you have a uh, banana that is green, if it experiences presence of ethylene, it will trigger it to start ripening. That's why you might have heard you should put your bananas inside a paper bag because the paper bag is made of wood. That particular or pulp, that particular pulp used to have ethylene and still does. That ethylene is filling the paper bag. Put your not quite ripe fruit or vegetables inside that paper bag and it's going to be exposed to ethylene. Ethylene is like the communication system between the plants. It tells them it's time to turn from not ripe to ripe. If you can detect ethylene, you can find out what crate of fruit in your warehouse happens to be most ready to be sold. The rotting fruit in particular emits a lot of ethylene. So it's important to keep detecting ethylene. And indeed, this company C2 Sense realized that all they need to do is take those carbon nanotubes, the ones from the first slide I showed you, that are one nanometer wide, dress those nanotubes with molecules. So again, kind of like the tennis ball with fuzzy end, except this time is a tube with fuzzy surface all around. And that fuzzy surface is going to be perfect Lego fit for the ethylene molecule to fit in. If there is an ethylene molecule that fits into it, the carbon nanotube changes its electric property just by a little bit. What electric property is this? Conductance. It changes how conductive it is. If I can measure how resistive or conductive that tube is, and I can just by using a simple voltmeter, I will know is ethylene present or not present in the atmosphere around me. All you need is, again, a piece of paper with painted, in this case, gold electrodes, and with a brush painted carbon nanotubes between those electrodes. Presence of ethylene will change the conductance of those tubes. And you will find yourself having a chemical sensor, an electronic nose that can detect anything. Indeed, if you can detect ammonia in the styes, uh, your pigs will, and cows will live a healthier life. And indeed, this company does provide that. Orchards that sell apples can save 10 to 20% of their produce by not allowing rotting of the apples because they can detect the crate of apples that's most ready to be used next or sold next. We can save about 10 to 15% of the US produce because that's how much rots in the warehouses if we use this very simple ethylene detection technology. The chemical sensing has been used. Yes, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, no. Before you go on, uh, there's a question from uh, Nathan. Uh, Nighty, uh, do you want to ask your question? Sure. So I know that uh, so that dogs can be trained to detect scents of diseases through uh, the, the nanoparticles that emit from the human body. 
And my, my question is, how, would that, how does that compare to the detection of diseases with nanoparticles by changing color? And oh. like, what is the advantage of one method over the other? You're, you're asking a fantastic question, Nathan. Um, so uh, the level of sensitivity is always important. And actually, the dog is a gold standard. Um, it, they are able to detect uh, presence of diseases. Uh, nitrous oxide, for example, is emitted by human body when a human body is in distress. Detecting that would be a really important thing to do. Um, I don't have a top of my head the level of detectivity for these uh, sensors, but I'll show you these other ones. These are just sensors for detecting landmines. Um, and I do know that these are as good as dogs nose in detecting a presence of trinitrotoluene, TNT. Uh, the way these work is where there are molecules that glow. This is a tin film of those molecules that's glowing on the left. And when a TNT lands on it, because it happens to be in the air, TNT is uh, very volatile because it's small. And it also is strongly electronegative, which means that if it lands onto this polymer, it will cause the polymer to stop glowing. That stopping of the glowing will stop that one molecule on which TNT lands to stop glowing. And it will stop the neighboring several hundred molecules around that one to also stop glowing due to a chemical process known as forced resonant energy transfer. Result is that you can, by observing glow, know the presence of TNT in the air. And it's as good as dogs knows which is the gold standard for detection of, of explosives. We also figured out a way to use anything that glows can often be made into a laser. A laser is a, an LED that's amplified. You can think of it that way. It's an amplifier of, of good glowing and also of bad glowing. We've shown that you can use these films, make them into lasing tin films, and improve the sensitivity 1,000 times over what dog can do over what the simple luminescence glow can do. Uh, this technology has been used actually uh, by US military as a way of replacing the dogs. So if dogs get tired, they, don't, they don't, are not able to operate in every environment. These though uh, operate in every environment and come in the form of a little handheld device that is able to provide you the information about the glow. Great, great, great uh, question. What, what, there are a couple more questions about, <clears throat> about detecting smell, so. Um, yeah. If, if we have time, please, uh, Kai, no, we, we, Kai we Song, time. Sorry, Kai Song, do you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah, so my question was, um, I know like human noses particularly, and also tongues, like they get affected by the cold temperature um, and they don't do so well in detecting like different smells. So my question is like, are these sensors also sensitive to like different temperature ranges? Like they must be in a warmer temperature or like, are there any other factors that might affect their performance? Uh, it's a fantastic question. Uh, so the answer is not very much, if anything at all. Um, you know, the, the, if anything, it turns out that the films that are glowing on the left would glow even better in a cold temperature. Um, the, what might stop them from working perfectly, right, would be humidity, because then those TNT molecules would be captured by the droplets of water in the air rather than having a chance to reach your sensor, right? Um, that is uh, uh, the most concern I would have when it comes to kind of reducing the sensitivity. But it's a great question. All right. Follow up, like what about, uh, what about like the smell sensors that you were showing earlier about like the ethylene? Uh, it's, it's, the, it's the same issue. It's, it shouldn't have any, any effect. Um, by the change in temperature, it really would be affected primarily by what are you exposing it to. And if the humidity, again, in the environment changes, then you're exposing it not just to the analyte, but also to the background material, in this case, water. Yeah. All right, thank you. All of right, course. and um, Zikian Zhao, do you want to ask your question? Um, yeah, hi. Um, so I know that like we have camera to like report like visual images and stuff, right? And like if we can detect and report like those scent particles, is it possible to like have something like a uh, scent camera? Like when you like for example, if you want to go to a forest and like you click a one button and it reports what like all the scent particles in the in the air, and then uh, it recreates it somewhere else. Is that possible? 
that that, that sounds awesome. Um, so, uh, you know, we can capture images really well and uh, like regular optical images and transmit them to our eye uh, very realistically. That's because we realize there is an orthogonal set of parameters, the red, the green, and the blue. So your, your screen right now is making only three, three colors, red color, green color, and blue color. And to make you see yellow, like in MIT Nano on the lower right, it's shining red and green at the same time. Your brain is detecting red and green at the same time and saying, ah, whenever I detect red and green, it must be that I'm looking at yellow. So that's we have realized for optical detection, we need three orthogonal colors, red, green, and blue. And I can make you believe anything that you see. For smell, we haven't yet figured out what is an orthogonal set of variables we need to provide so that we can then go ahead and make your nose tricked into smelling, uh, into experiencing the smell of anything else. Uh, that, that is a very important still, I believe there still might be a Nobel Prize in there available uh, for anyone to, among you guys who wants to discover this to figure out the orthogonal set of uh, variables that would be needed to provide any scent of smell that we want. But making an electronic nose able to detect different kinds of analytes, ammonia, ethylene, TNT. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. We can do that right now. We just don't know which ones are the basic primary sets we need to provide so that we can then go ahead and expel those analytes to make you believe that you're smelling a certain thing. I see. Like, so like, oh, sorry, real quick for love. So like for you, is it like, like if you have like if you have just a very simple sets and then you detect like three and then you'll be able to like emit like what, six cents that kind of stuff that's possible right yeah yeah maybe yeah <laughs> but, i mean it, it requires a lot more exploration and people are trying to figure it out it's the, officially it's known as the electronic nose and once you have it then maybe you can make the olfunctory stimuli stimulator so that when you are in your augmented reality field of poppies or flowers, you can actually not just see the flowers in your augmented or virtual reality, but also smell them and hence make the environment a lot more immersive. <laughs> but, uh, the, of oh. course, uh, the sense of smell is most memorable of senses. Uh, and uh, I, I, It would be incredible for us to be able to reproduce it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so let's see, Vlad, just just to give you a time check. So I'm, I'm looking at the time. Um, if if you're able to wrap up in in the next couple minutes, sorry, sorry, I didn't give you more. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. Morning, that would be yeah. great. And then and then we'll um, maybe have time for like one question, and then we have a small presentation. So excellent. Uh, so I'll I'll spend one more minute on on smell just to let you know that if you want to uh, smell landmines, one other way to do it is to actually uh, engineer plants that, upon the exposure to TNT, like buried landmines, might be. Um, they'll actually change the color of the leaf. And so this is a way, if there is a field of landmines and you don't really know where they are, uh, you fly a plane, you sprinkle it with seeds, come back, water it, come back you know, when the plants are grown and you'll be able to identify the presence uh, of them. If you're a bumblebee, uh, you actually talk to other bumblebees by releasing scents. Uh, and these are the molecules on the, uh, that um, you would be releasing to inform the other bumblebees about, you know, we are being attacked. There is um, honey on that side or flowers on that side of the field. Uh, so the sense of smell has been used by nature continually, including grass, you know, that sweet smell of cut grass. That sounds like, you know, oh my gosh, I mean, uh, I'm in nature, you know, someone is cutting the grass. Oh, this smells really, really good. Well, I'm gonna change your, <laughs> I'm gonna change your thinking of that because it turns out the reason why you smell cut grass is because the grass that's cut is informing the other grass that's not quite yet cut that there is danger coming its way. The cut grass and the smell of it really is the grass screaming to other grasses, hey, you're about to be attacked. Send your nutrients to your roots so that when you get eaten, you will still have plenty of nutrients to regrow the leaves that are going to be eaten momentarily. Yeah, the sense of smell is a remarkable, <laughs> remarkable ability. There are many more things to talk to you about because the nano age that we are stepping into 
is just upon us. We finally can see the world at that dimension of nanoscale we could never see before. And as a result, we can start reimagining what that world can be with those building blocks. There are many, many more to tell you about. And so who knows? Maybe we'll meet again and I'll have a chance to tell you some more. Um, certainly stop by MIT anytime. If you find MIT Nano right at the heart of a campus, let us know. And we'd love to give you a tour, show you what's the latest stuff we're working on. All right. Um, thank you so much. That was really fascinating. And, um, you know, uh, we had a bunch of questions that, uh, as we went, uh, some we didn't get to. Again, I apologize. But um, thank you so much. That was that was great. I'd like to invite um, Michelle Chen and Jack uh, Rimmel up uh, for a short presentation. Michelle Chen and, um, and Jack uh, Rimmel, are, are you there? Yeah, hi. Um, thank you so much hi. for giving us such a great seminar. It was really fascinating to see how like um, these small particles has such a big effect on our everyday lives. And it's real. It's really amazing to see like the development that um, companies have been putting towards using this these nanotechnologies for for development for the future. So thank yeah. you. It's all, it's been very interesting, especially seeing as how far we've progressed and how we've been using certain technologies, like with the stained glass panes that you were talking about earlier. We've been using things before. We really know how they work, and now that we know how they work, we've been able to use them more in depth and find more useful uses in stained glass, like diagnosing diseases. It's been very cool. Well, thank you. Thank you both for saying that. And thank you all for attending. I've, 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 I'm humbled um, by all the chat that has indeed um, transpired since the talk began. Thank you so much for being interested in it. Thank you. I, I was going to conclude by saying that um, the world is about to be yours. Uh, everything that we are working on today will be the tools you will use tomorrow as you design the world that needs to be. The challenges are abundance of what we need to resolve. Is it energy? Is it water crisis? Is it food? Is it climate change? We need to figure out many, many things. And we need people like you <laughs> to take on and continue the amazing work that you have gotten up to now to take that next step and uh, train yourself to have the ability to explore the nanoscale and have the ability through that to recognize a set of absolutely needed solutions. So thank you very much for being engaged by participating in the BeaverWorks program. I, I... Brad, uh, this is Bob Shin. Uh, thank you so much. <clears throat> Quick question. <clears throat> Some of the students were asking, since uh, you didn't get a chance to finish your talk, what, what might be in the remaining set of slides. So would it be possible for you to share the, your slides? We can share with the students or point, us, point them to some other uh, talk, your talk that's available online. They would love to share with them and because I think there's so much interest on this topic. So. Well, thank you so much. Uh, you know, I, I certainly I love sharing. Um, I think that the sharing of the of the slides is even more powerful if there is a good narration. With, uh, images mean a lot, but images that are well described go even further. Uh, the, okay. the, you know, the, there is there are many things to describe, and you know, the rest of the slides. The talk never ends, right? I mean, we can keep on going. <laughs> I have a. Uh, I, you know, I haven't told you a variety of ways to make the best looking television set ever using right, quantum right, dots. Right, I right, haven't told right. you how to make the world's lightest and most potent solar technologies ever imagined uh, right. using essentially fabrics. Um, and this is a solar cell, 120 times lighter than silicon. That is coming your way and will change the way we think about energy nor have I told you about how to make a paper thin acoustic surface that yeah. is a speaker that can direct the sound right, like acoustic right, holograms. Right, but right. there are many, many others. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah. what I can do, and I'll be glad to do is share with you maybe a TEDx talk or- Yeah, they uh, right, right. uh, would be fantastic. Would of be fantastic. course. <laughs> okay, thank you.